Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we have just started the webinar Living with Fire in Salt Spring Island. I'm just going to give everybody a minute to arrive here. All right, I think we have everybody. Uh, so thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we're here for the Living with Wildfire in Salt Spring Island webinar. My name is Jonathan Reimer uh, and I am with the Capital Regional District, which is your local government in Salt Spring Island. Uh, today we're getting together. This is a new way for us to communicate uh, with you folks about wildfire risk and how you can prepare your home, your family, your community. Uh, let's just get into it. So what you're gonna see today, uh, the format, and I'm gonna do a really quick orientation to Zoom. All of you made it this far. Yeah, I feel like it, it gets easier from here on. Thank you very much for joining us, by the way. I appreciate it. it's gonna be about an hour and a half of your time. And we're hoping to make really good use of your time. Uh, we have two speakers. Uh, you're gonna have to start off listening to me for, for quite some time. I have a, a speech called Living with Wildfire. Uh, and then following that, I'm co-presenting along with the Salt Spring Island Fire Rescue. And we have Mitchell Sharon joining us, who is our local FireSmart representative. Uh, he'll be talking on FireSmart landscaping. After that, we have a question and answer session. And I'll quickly talk a little bit about how that works. Uh, before we even get there, just note that we are recording this webinar and with the hope that we'll be sharing this publicly following, uh, following this webinar, we'll, we'll put it up on some, some sort of streaming platform. You've probably noticed that your video and your audio are disabled. The chat as well is disabled, but if you do need to get an, uh, some information to us, you can type something in there, we'll probably receive it. But where I want you to focus most of your attention today is in that Q&A box, you know, you're seeing your, your uh, your toolbar there for sometimes at the top, at the top, sometimes at the bottom. Uh, that Q and A session, you can click on that at any time, and you can ask any question about something you heard. If you want to hear more about that topic, if we didn't cover something, or if we didn't touch on a topic that you want to hear information about it, don't be shy. Please go into that box. Please type that. At the end of our presentations today, we're going to be going through those questions. So we're going to be picking out some and answering them here live in front of the audience. So with that, I think we're going to jump into the, set, the webinar today. Uh, and so you're going to be hearing a lot of information about wildfires, about um, technical information, about what, what drives them, what you can do to prepare. Uh, don't feel like you have to take notes. Uh, there's not going to be any test here, but what are, I really want you to take away from our presentation today is three things. I really want you to know uh, what your wildfire risk is in Salt Spring Island, because as you can see, wildfires is an incredible year for us, but it's not easy to understand what does Lytton, for example, mean for Salt Spring Island. The second thing I want to make sure that you guys get, uh, step away with is a better understanding of what to expect when there is a fire in your area. What's gonna happen? What is that gonna look like? And the third and perhaps most important piece of that is a better understanding of what you and your family can do to prepare for a wildfire because there's quite a lot there. So my name is Jonathan Reimer, as I mentioned before. Uh, I have been blessed to work in wildfire for most of my career. My background, I was an incident commander and a crew leader with BC Wildfire Service. Uh, I was also with Parks Canada as a wildfire manager on the National Incident Management Team. I was the Provincial Emergency Management Duty Officer with Emergency Management BC, and more relevant, my position now is uh, as the Manager of Fire and Emergency Programs at the Capital Regional District. I'm also the Emergency Operations Center Director, so that is the Emergency Operations Center for Salt Spring Island. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about wildfire in your area. So just to jump into it, uh, I know you guys are paying attention. I know you guys are seeing 
uh, news articles and social media, uh, radio, you're hearing and you're seeing wildfire, um, perhaps not every day, but probably every week. Oftentimes these stories are from across the globe, Australia, California, other parts of BC. And what we want to really do today is zoom in to Salt Spring and what does all this information, what do all these news stories mean for you? Uh, and so just to acknowledge, yes, you're, you're seeing stories on Australia and they had that really catastrophic year in 2020. Uh, most every year you're seeing something on California. Uh, they seem to be breaking records almost yearly. And then over in the interior of British Columbia, uh, we're breaking records again year after year. In 2017, we broke the, the record for in modern history but how many hectares were burnt in a single year. In 2018, we broke that record again. And here we are in the middle of July and uh, we're seeing an incredibly active fire season. Uh, we're seeing some incredible community impacts, some really tragic impacts like what we saw in Lytton approximately a week and a half ago, uh, where you saw the, the, store, the town on the left-hand side there turn into the town on the right-hand side. Uh, a fire started with really short notice uh, moved through the town incredibly quickly and people had very little time to escape and very tragically two people lost their lives. That is a real abnormal, it's, it's not common in, uh, in BC for people to lose their lives to wildfire, um, but we have seen that in the last week and a half and it shows the tragic, it shows the scale of what we're talking about, the importance of it. So Salt Spring Island, uh, this is a random picture. But you can see, you know, we are a forested landscape. We have a landscape of lots of people and lots of wildlands. That's why people love living there. Uh, and what does that mean as far as fire? Uh, you know, we have seen fire uh, historically on Salt Spring, but in living memory, we don't have a lot of examples of what fire would look like on Salt Spring. And so it's easy to either uh, panic on one side and really think, you know, there, there's, um, uh, kind of be a bit uh, doom and gloom about the prospects of wildfire on Salt Spring. And on the other side, there's a, the opportunity to say, hey, you know, we've never seen fire. Why should I start worrying about that now? I want to talk today about uh, a middle way in between those. And I think a little bit of information can go a long way. Uh, the first thing I want to, to recognize is that things are getting worse. We're in a no analog situation in terms of climate change. Climate change is making your fire danger worse every year, every decade, and we expect that to continue. We see temperatures rising, approximately two degrees on the west coast of, of North America, a bit less in our area, we'll talk about that in a second. However, that means where we do get snow in some of those higher altitude areas of Salt Spring, that snow is not sticking around for any length of time. We're seeing that rain-free period in summer extend, drier in the spring, drier in the fall. And that means that our forests are drier for longer, we're seeing a slight increase in lightning. So we're seeing more fires start. And the fires that we do see start, they're burning more hectares, impacting more communities. And we do expect that to continue. So with all of this news, there's lots of good reasons to, to worry. But my message today for all of you guys is don't panic. And I'm gonna explain why. Uh, generally with these types of questions, uh, my, uh, my first, um, re reaction is to turn to the science. What is the research say? What does the science say about risk? What does the science say about fire behavior in our area? So that's what we're going to explore here. The good news is that fire uh, science, fire behavior science is fairly well established. If we know as researchers or scientists, practitioners, where a fire starts, what fuel that fire is burning in, what vegetation is burning in, that's the other way of saying that. And then what sort of weather is happening and weather can be a lot of things, wind, humidity, temperature, and so on. Uh, then we can tell you with a fair degree of accuracy how hot that fire is gonna burn. We can tell you uh, where that fire is gonna be in the canopy horizontally and then vertically across the landscape. And we can tell you um, how fast that fire is gonna be spreading. That same fire behavior science allows us to say with also a very, fairly good degree of accuracy, if we know about how many fires start or approximately how much we can expect to start in the near, near future, what the causes of those fires are, 
what your vegetation and ecosystems are across your island and what type of weather you currently get or can expect to get in the near future. That allows us to get a really good understanding of the fire hazard in your area. And there's a few names we use for that. You probably see burn probability or provincial strategic threat analysis, all sorts of fancy names. But uh, the idea is that we get an idea of what kind of risk you are at. So I'm gonna start here in the United States because I really like the way that they, they do business. I like the way that they present their data. Uh, and this is one analysis that they do down there. You, we're not on this map, uh, or at least not in any color, but you can see what it's telling us. Here on the west side of the United States, that's where most of our hazard is. That's where you can see the reds and the yellows, uh, you know, coming up through North, New Mexico, California, uh, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and so on. Uh, petering out a little bit in the green towards our area. And then we can zoom in a little bit here. This is another analysis that was done a few years ago. Zoom is, zooms into just Washington and Oregon. And here you can see that the real hazard in our area tends to be to the east of the Cascade. So kind of sandwiched in between the Rocky Mountains and the Cascade. As you move in toward the coast, a bit less hazard. So in, in some places that hazard drops off to, to virtually zero. Uh, you can see the San Juan Islands, which are our neighbors, and then the Olympic Peninsula that we can see from our area. So moving into BC now, this is analysis that uh, the Provincial uh, Wildfire Service puts out. Uh, our colors are a little bit more exciting. We don't have necessarily any more risk here, but uh, it certainly looks pretty. Uh, more or less the same story. So you can see here on the right-hand side of your screen, a little bit of green there. That's the Rocky Mountains. On the left, another strip of green, that's the coastal mountains, those cascades. And in between, that's where you see the yellows and the reds and the oranges, most of our fire danger there. Uh, coming in specifically through the Okanagan, this is the Fraser Canyon. Coming up north through the Caribou, uh, you can see the Chicolton Plateau. Uh, many of you will be looking for Lytton for good reason. Uh, that Lytton, I, I put a little star in there and you can see that, that little strip of orange. Uh, but when you get moving towards our area in the south of the island, it turns a little bit gray. And so I'm going to zoom in here and make you a little bit of a caveat. This is not a great map. I do not really like to show this map because the wildfire service does not map hazard on private land. Less than 5% of the land in BC is private land, but in our area, it's actually most of the land that we care about. Uh, and for some reason, they decided to put Duncan right through the middle of uh, Salt Spring Island. So we're not learning a lot here, but if you can squint, you can see a little bit of the story. Uh, you're seeing most of our hazard here represented in the lows and the moderates. So not the same level of uh, wildfire risk that we're seeing in the interior, in between the Cascades and the Rockies. There's one more map I'll show you here uh, that does do a good job of showing where the, the hazard is on the island. But I just do want to note that this is a relative map. So the areas of red in the extreme, that's not the red that you see, for example, in Lytton, that's a relative uh, value. So this is an old map from 2005. Uh, I don't even really like showing this map either. Uh, and so we are working together, the fire department and capital regional district to update this map. And so you can expect by this time next year, we're going to have a better map and we're going to be sharing that, that information with you as soon as we get. So we kind of saw what the science is telling us. What is the science telling us? There is hazard in BC. However, that hazard is not as high in Salt Spring Island as it is in some other areas. And why is that? So we're, I'd like to tease apart and to dive into the aspects of fire hazard. And why is it different here in Salt Spring than some other parts? So the first part of that story is ignitions. You can't have a fire if the fire doesn't start. There's only two ways that wildfires start. They either start by lightning or they start by a person doing something. And that is a really big category. That includes a power line coming down. That includes a vehicle accident. That includes an escape uh, campfire. It includes all sorts of things that people do that can start fires. But the only natural fire we have in our area is lightning. 
in BC generally, most of our light, our fires start by lightning. Uh, in our area, we don't see nearly that much. So in our area, 90% of our fires start from people. That's really mostly because we don't have much lightning in our area to the point where, where people hear the crash bang of the thunder. There's a lot of confusion. People go to online messaging boards. They ask what that is because we get so little lightning. That means we get so little lightning fires. They do happen, but not that much. That's really good news because lightning fires tend to be bigger and they, they tend to be more difficult to control. The next part of our local context is fire weather. And I don't think it's gonna be a surprise to any of you folks, but our fire weather on Salt Spring is dominated by the ocean. It's dominated by that marine influence. And so the three biggest inputs into what allows, what controls the amount of fire on the landscape in terms of weather is your temperature, your humidity, and your rainfall. So just to take that in turn, our temperatures here on Salt Spring Island, I've tried to give you a little bit of an example there. Uh, Salt Spring, your, your average max uh, is 21 degrees in August. At Kelowna is a little bit higher, 27 degrees. So that, that is a fairly big difference between you and the interior. Temperature obviously dries out the vegetation. Really, fire loves really hot days. Uh, humidity is actually something that's really underappreciated because it controls the amount of moisture in the vegetation, or at least it's a large input in, in uh, the amount of moisture in the vegetation. And you can see there's a difference. Our, our uh, relative humidity levels in Salt Spring are much higher than the levels that you would get, see the interior. And that numbers that I have here, they don't actually tell us the whole story. Uh, for a lot of the interior, it's not unusual for you to get down to double or single digits. Uh, so whether that's six or seven percent humidity, incredibly dry numbers in Salt Spring, uh, very rare for us to get below 30 percent humidity. It does happen. Uh, in fact, a week and a half ago, we got down to 14 percent humidity, which is very, very low, historically low for our area. Uh, but generally, the story is because of that marine influence, much more humidity in the air and fire does not like that at all. Rainfall, uh, the, the story here is not quite as stark in that we, do, we don't get a lot of rainfall in our summers. We get slightly more than they do the, in, in the interior, but maybe the story there is more that uh, the way that, that the interior receives that rain, they tends to be in thunder showers where you can get 20 or 30 millimeters in the space of uh, two hours or so. You know, so a lot of rain in a really short amount of time where our rain tends to come uh, more spread out in, in normal patterns and that allows the vegetation and the landscape to use that that rain to, um, uh, to increase the amount of moisture in the vegetation. That's basically the long and short of it. And then the other part that is important to know is the fuel. So I've given you two examples here of fuels that are fairly good. They, fire likes them. They uh, receive fire and they spread fire well. So on the left-hand side, that's California. That's a chaparral forest, it's a brush. Uh, as you can look at it, you can imagine very easy to start a fire in that. And when a fire does start there, it's gonna spread both horizontally and vertically very, very quickly, difficult to control. On the right-hand side, that's from the interior of the BC. Uh, that's a lodgepole pine forest. You can see a lot of dead and dying uh, pine in there. That's from that mountain pine beetle. And there are some areas of the interior that are still struggling with that. And generally you can just see that the fuels are dense they're dense horizontally and they're dense vertically. So the fire can start in there fairly easily. And when the fire does, it can move up into the canopy without much resistance. So things are a little bit different on Salt Spring Island. And I don't want to reduce this too much. And you have a, a, a big variety in what the vegetation that you guys have and the ecosystems that you guys have on your island. That's why you live there. However, you are all in the coastal Douglas fir biogeoclimactic zone, which is a really special zone and a really rare zone. Of all the biogeoclimactic zones in BC, it's by far the smallest. Uh, it's a moist marine type of vegetation. And it's made up of, if you see in that little pinwheel there, those are the types of vegetation that you have across your island. What you can see there from the structure is that there's not a lot of ground fuels so it is possible to start a fire in this, but it's not that easy. And when the fire does start, it's, very, it's not gonna be easy for that fire to 
um, what we use what we call ladder fuels to, to get from the ground up into the crown of, uh, of the trees. And so we don't see that very often. And that's really good news because crown fires are much more difficult to control and move much faster. Now, obviously, that's not the only type of vegetation you have on Salt Spring Island. You also have open wooded grasslands. Uh, those tend to have those light flashy fuels right at the bottom, that actual grass, those forbs. Those do receive fire a little bit better, and it spreads fire fairly quickly. Uh, the good news there is that the fire tends to be fairly low intensity. And so when the crews do respond to that fire, it's usually fairly easy for that fire to be controlled. Uh, also, not a lot of ladder fuels in this zone. You're not going to get a canopy fire building off uh, this type of vegetation. It's, it's basically impossible. Next, we're going to talk about climate change. Climate change is not a good news story in your area. It's not a good news story anywhere. However, it, there's some relatively good news story in that most of areas of BC are warming at a faster rate than we are here on the coast. And the reason for that is that the oceans are warming at a slightly slower rate than the land. So we are in some ways uh, less than half as warm relative in some parts of the interior. And then all these things add together to mean that we don't see the same types of impacts from wildfire on the coast that we do see in the interior. Uh, you know, you're seeing year after year the same areas burn in the interior. And on the coast, we're seeing rarely any kind of community impacts. This is a bit of a complicated graph, uh, but it was a, uh, a, a survey done. And the story there is you see caribou, Kamloops, Prince George, Southeast, people in those areas remember when they were last evacuated and it was relatively recently. On the coast where most people live, uh, people either don't remember any time that they were evacuated or know that it has been a very long time since they've been evacuated for wildfires. So that's really good news because that's really what matters in the end. So I wanna take all of that information I just gave you and add a bit of an asterisk to it. I wanna add a little bit of context because there are times when what I just said isn't true for one reason or another, and it is worth paying attention. And the first time I'm gonna talk about is outflow winds. So this happens a couple times every year, usually it happens for at least a couple of days, sometimes even a week or more, you get what's called outflow winds. That happened uh, about a week and a half or two weeks ago when we had that crazy record-breaking heat wave. We had really hot air mass in the interior, and that air mass was pushing out through the Fraser Valley, through Howe Sound, blowing over southern Vancouver Island and blowing over Salt Spring Island. That air mass was extremely warm and extremely dry. So that when I was talking about 14% humidity and temperatures of 39 or degrees or more, uh, that is something that we do not see unless it's the, a rare outflow condition. So when this does happen, and it does happen for a couple of days every year, uh, we wanna pay attention because the, the conditions are, are really good for starting fires and for spreading fires. And the other time to pay attention is anytime you have fuels that are abnormal for some reason or another, they're not what you would expect to find on Salt Spring Island. So fuels that can in include slash, so any area that's been logged or harvested recently, you can see on that picture, a lot of woody debris just open to the air and open to the sunshine sitting on that coast. Obviously that fuel is going to receive fire very well and it's gonna burn hot and burn well if it does burn. Uh, almost all of the major fires in my experience that I had when I was an incident commander on the coast had a large uh, slash component to them. Uh, the, the um, kind of balancing factor on those slash fires is generally when they move to the edge of the block and transition into more mature fuels, more heavy standing timber, the fire behavior declines really rapidly. And that allows us as firefighters to catch it right at the end, edge of that block. Uh, we don't tend to see those slash fires move into the standing timber and cause the crown fires that we don't wanna see. The other time to pay attention is invasive species. And I know you guys have some really good community groups in your area that have the slogan cut, broom and bloom, fantastic groups that really makes a difference to your fire danger on the island uh, because those both broom and gorse are incredibly oily. And so they burn really well. 
the more we do in, in terms of managing that invasive, invasive vegetation, uh, the safer you and your, com your communities are going to be. So I hope that gives you a bit more information than you had about what your wildfire risk is on Salt Spring Island. And I want to shift a little bit and talk about what you can expect when fire does come to your door in Salt Spring Island. Uh, and I wanna be really clear here is that you can expect more fire and you can expect fire near your communities in Salt Spring Island. If not this year, then one year soon. Then uh, the reason for that is that uh, we have as firefighters tried our best to exclude uh, wildfire on the landscapes across British Columbia. And we're seeing that become uh, really ineffective. We're, we're not able to exclude fire in the way that we once were able to. Uh, this is a difficult graph to read, but what you have here is back in the twenties, you have a fair bit of fire on the landscape. These blue bars are the hectares burnt on average. Uh, and then you can see more, a uh, fair bit of fire, growing less and less by the year. And then in the late nineties, getting into the two thousands, you're seeing those the fire uh, hectares per year increase again. And uh, you saw the, these are the two, 2017 and 2018 values that were really record breaking. Uh, we expect that to continue into the future. So fire is coming into your area. And one thing just to talk about really quickly is oftentimes we hear that there's an unnatural amount of fire on our landscapes, a lot of concern about that. And uh, fire scientists and researchers often debate about how much more fire there used to be than there is now. But what we don't debate about is whether there was more fire than there is now. Uh, when we look at all sorts of historical precedents, whether that's traditional knowledge from First Nations, or uh, we can look at, you have some long living trees in your area. So you can look at the fire scars, we call that dendrochronologies going back hundreds of years. And with the charcoal records in lakes, uh, we can go back even thousands of years and see the fire frequency over time. Uh, this is a really difficult to understand graph here, uh, but this dotted black line is what you're looking for. Uh, it, it tells us that uh, 4,000 years ago or so, there was quite a bit more fire than we have here. Uh, and then you see that uh, trend just lower. And then recently, since you're an American settlement, uh, the trend is increasing again. So we're seeing more fire again. Uh, why does that matter? I think it matters really because we need to understand that fire is not necessarily the enemy and, and fire was here before any of us what, were. Uh, we do have some ecosystems on Salt Spring that are fire dependent or fire maintained. And by excluding fire, we've done those areas quite a lot of harm in terms of ecological integrity. Uh, the one I'm gonna show here by, by, by not, no means the only one is Gary Oak. Uh, you guys are familiar with this species. It's in the foreground there. It's not a great picture there, uh, but it's an open ecosystem, often occurs in grasslands. Uh, it was distributed pretty broadly across Salt Spring Island in the green. And then our present day distribution is just less. Some areas that we've completely eradicated Gary Oak from the areas and some in other areas is just less Gary Oak of where, the, where there used to be. There's a bunch of reasons for that, but one of them is because we've gone and excluded fire for a long, large amount of time. We've allowed competing species to come in and replace that Gary Oak. So fire comes to your doorstep and it is coming. What are you gonna see? Who responds? Uh, you're gonna see your fire department. So Salt Spring Island Fire Rescue, they're gonna be showing up in their, in their trucks. Uh, they're in generally a, a volunteer-based fire department and they're going to be the incident command for most fires on Salt Spring Island. Uh, you may also see the wildfire service, the BC wildfire service. Their local base is actually here on the mainland or, or large island, we can call it. Uh, and they're based out of Cobble Hill, uh, but they do respond by helicopter and they respond fairly quickly, often uh, in as little as 15 minutes from that base. So, you know, they can get to places fairly quickly. They're usually assisting us here in Salt Spring Island. Sometimes they will be incident commander, particularly on the area of the Southwest uh, of uh, Salt Spring Island. There's a couple areas there where uh, BC wildfire actually has jurisdiction. And the other people we might see is our Salt Spring Island emergency program. Uh, those folks are really uh, responsible for coordinating our responders. 
and in ensuring that you as the public get good information about the emergencies that are happening and we are able to assist any people who are evacuated by a wildfire. What are you going to see? Uh, you're going to see big fire trucks, not all red, but a lot of them are. Uh, you might see fire trucks. Uh, this one here on the right hand side is one from BC Wildfire Service. Even more likely, you're going to see our aviation resources. So this is a helicopter with a, a line attached to a, what we call a Bambi bucket, usually. It's taking water from lakes or from rivers, sometimes the ocean, transporting that water to the fire and, and, and releasing the, the water on top. On the right hand side, this is an air tanker. So it's a fixed wing airplane. We fill it full of that red stuff, that's fire retardant. Both of the helicopters and the planes, their job is to get to that fire and slow it down, quiet down the fire behavior so that crews can move in and actually put that fire out on the ground. And so what are crews doing on the ground? Uh, they're most likely moving water around. So you're going to see that in the, uh, they're going to be using pumps, very likely this pump, it's a, it's a classic called Mark III. We're going to be using hose, uh, carrying that, sometimes we have incredible hose lays out there. You may see us digging in the ground, and it seems um, kind of silly because we're creating uh, you know, fuel separations that are not that large. But what we're trying to do is put some mineral soil in between the side that we can have fire on and the side that we really want to keep fire out of. And it's really effective, uh, more effective than you might think. And the last tool that we sometimes use is fire itself. So we'll have uh, prescribed fire or controlled burns. And we'll be adding fire to the landscape. The idea there is that uh, we can put fire along an existing fuel break. It looks like in the picture they're using an old road. Uh, that fire is going to be low intensity. That fire will burn towards the fire that is out of control. The two fires meet. Uh, they have nowhere to go. They run out of fuel and put themselves out. It's a really effective tool that uh, we use when we can. Uh, we don't get to use it that often on, on Salzburg Island, so you won't be, aren't likely to see it. Um, but it is a really effective tool. So if you do see these things in your area, and if you do have a fire on your doorstep, uh, one thing I'd like to say to you again, don't panic. And why is that? Is living with fire and having fires in your area, it's just part of, of living in BC. It's not necessarily anything as in terms of an emergency for you and your family. On average, we have about 1,500 fires each year in BC. And 96% of those fires are contained by crews before they, it hits four hectares, which is a fairly small size. Uh, for an example, last year was a particularly quiet year, but we only had three evacuation orders and those orders impacted just a handful of people and homes. Uh, even though we have a fairly active year this year, so certainly more active than last year, uh, we currently, uh, I checked this afternoon, we only have 660 homes approximately on evacuation order right now from fires. And that's been going down. So it was a little bit higher uh, last week, but uh, that number has been going down as some of those fires in the Okanagan move in a, in a way and they get a little bit more control of them in terms of crews. So what can you do if there is a wildfire in your area? Well, one thing we would ask you to do is to make sure you're getting really good information. Uh, you know, I, I have a little quote here, a lie can travel halfway around the world. Well, the truth is putting on its shoes. And that's from my experience as an instant commander and a firefighter, where we come into these communities, uh, you know, whether it's during a fire or after a fire, and people tell us the most incredible stories about how that fire started or what we're doing or how the, the fire uh, action is going. Usually far more interesting stories uh, than what is actually happening. And, you know, there's a lot of good information out there these days. There's almost no excuse for not having good information. Uh, I really want to uh, promote BC Wildfire Service and their website, their app, their Twitter, their Facebook, all of that stuff. They do a great job of putting good information out in a way that is incredibly real time. The information that they have on their website in terms of how many fires there are and what size they are. That's near real time. That is, information is basically as good as what we have in the Emergency Operations Center here. In fact, right before this uh, webinar, we went online just to check, and we found that there was a new wildfire in our area over in the Juan de Fuca area that we weren't aware of. That's how up to date 
that that uh, website is that we knew it um, by checking the website before we even got wind of it in any other way. The other place I really want to push here is the Salt Spring Island Emergency Program. Uh, we have various uh, social media platforms there as well. And we also have a CRD website that tells you a lot of information about what you can do to prepare before, during, and after an emergency. Uh, and then lastly, uh, if there was for any reason Parks Canada got involved, we do have crews there. Uh, they can do some updates through their website as well. Now that middle bar there is for media. Uh, generally recognized media, they are pretty good about uh, not putting out uh, speculative information to the community. They're going to have good information and timely information for you. And whether that's in the internet, the radio, or the TV, that's something you can probably trust. But the last thing I want to emphasize is that if there is information that the Emergency Operations Center or the incident commander needs you to know, for example, an, emer an emergency evacuation, uh, they will tell you. You don't have to hear about it through the grapevine, through uh, Salt Spring Exchange or any other uh, places. You're going to hear about it directly. We're going to be knocking on your door. We're going to be using loudspeakers. We're going to be using every tool that we have to get you that information. Uh, one way that we do put out information is called the Public Alert Notification System. And that's a subscription-based service that I'm going to talk about here that allows us in the Emergency Operations Center to push information uh, about emergencies directly to you that is based on exactly where you are. And it does it instantly. So uh, I'm gonna talk about it in, in a bit, but it's really important that you sign up for that. So evacuations, they do happen. Uh, and what do they mean? There's two messages we put out about evacuations that can be a little bit confusing. Only one of them means that you actually have to leave your home. There's an evacuation alert and there's an evacuation order. So an evacuation alert, we'll start there. Uh, the idea there is that the incident commander and the emergency operations center has, have gotten together, looked at this fire and say, there is a chance that this fire could impact uh, homes or a community within the next few days. And so we want people to start thinking about what would they do if they had to leave their home suddenly? Where would they go? Uh, how would they pick their kids up from school? Do they have uh, a plan? Do they have uh, the equipment that they would need? And we want to give them lots of time to plan for that. Most of the time that we put an evacuation alert on for a community, that community is not evacuated. So it doesn't mean that you will definitely be evacuated. However, we do wanna give you guys lots of time to think of and prepare for an evacuation. Next, we have the evacuation order. That does mean that you are at risk. Uh, we want you to leave the area immediately. Uh, it doesn't mean that the fire is licking at your doorstep. The reason we put in evacuation order is usually when we can't 100% guarantee that we're going to have lots of time to move all the people safely before an a fire impacts the way out of your community. So we want to give you lots of time. You know, we're, we're uh, fairly conservative with the way that we use evacuation orders because the, the worst thing that we can ever imagine is for somebody to be impacted neg negatively, uh, their health uh, from a wildfire. Uh, so if you are given an evacuation order, does that mean you're gonna lose your home? Uh, the answer is almost certainly not. Almost everybody who's put on evacuation order eventually returns to their home, returns to their community, and their house is fine. It just means that it's not a safe place for you to be for whatever reason. Most evacuation alerts and orders are fairly small. So we would very rarely and, and perhaps never, I, I can't imagine a situation when we put, would put the entire island of Salt Spring on an evacuation order or alert. What we're really talking about is individ individual blocks, individual cul-de-sacs, parts of streets, parts of neighborhoods, often uh, a few homes or a few dozen homes. If you have been evacuated, uh, you're gonna be given lots of information about what to do. We're gonna give you a place to go and register. And we do ask you to register. And the reason we ask you to register is that you can imagine there's a lot of people who are going to be concerned about you. Uh, are you safe? And so we want to make able sure that we are able to tell them that yes, you were able, you got out, that we can reunite you with your loved ones uh, if, if you were had to be evacuated for any kind of fire emergency. So please do go to the reception center. Please do register yourself. Uh, once you've done that, you most likely want to contact your friends, 
contacts of family, contact neighbors that are outside of that emergency operations or emergency evacuation area. Uh, very good chance that you might want to stay with them. Perhaps they can put you up for a short amount of time. Uh, if you do leave and choose to get a hotel or to go to restaurants, uh, check your insurance. Most people's house insurance should cover you, but not everybody's. So if you do review the details of your insurance, uh, particularly ahead of time, you don't want to be doing this while you're being evacuated, then you can leave with some peace of mind that you'll be covered if you are evacuated in an emergency. Uh, but the last thing I want to leave with you with is that uh, don't worry that you're going to be sleeping on the streets or going hungry because you had to leave your house because of evacuation. Uh, the province will cover you. There's an, a, a basic amount of uh, services that will provide anybody who is forced to leave their house for an emergency. And that includes a basic level of shelter, clothes, and food. You know, it's not going to be luxurious. It may mean sleeping on a, on a cot in a church or in a, an auditorium or a school, perhaps with a couple dozen, perhaps with a couple hundred other people. Uh, however, you'll be served food by uh, really caring volunteers. Uh, emergency support services are delivered by volunteers in your community. And so I really uh, recommend you reaching out. Uh, in our area, we use the Red Cross for this. Please contact them. If, if this is something, uh, we always are looking for folks to help us deliver that service to people who are forced from their homes in an emergency. And we rely on the goodwill of volunteers to help us do that. So I really want to talk about a case study because we talk a lot about various things, humidity, uh, evacuations, and so on. And it can be hard to understand how is that going to play out in practice. Uh, and I want to give you an, a, a really solid example of a fire that we saw not that recently, but not that long ago on the Gulf Islands. Uh, here is the news. Engine two, attack one. The island inferno forcing people to leave their homes. Uh, and that was a fire that we had in 2006 in Galliano. What happened there, uh, this fire was actually spotted from Salt Spring Island. So that was really impressive, really nice work, uh, whoever called that in. Uh, it was an incredibly dry year. Uh, we've had drier years since, but at the time it was the fourth driest year on record. We had a strong outflow, the strong winds with it. Uh, and then we had a human caused ignition during a fire ban. So it was a legal fire start. It happened in late July. So get the period that we're getting into here. The fuels there were just as we dis discussed, they were harvested. They were harvested back in 1985. So there were some juvenile uh, trees in there, 15 to 20 year old stand of Douglas fir with significant slash debris underneath. And here are, I, I found it difficult to get good landscape level pictures. And so I kind of apologize for the quality here, but you can zoom in and you can see the types of fuels we're talking about here on the left-hand side. That's the extent of the fire. Uh, that's Montague Harbor in the background, for people who know this area. And then looking at the fire afterwards, this is several days after, this is the area and those are the fuels that we're discussing as far as the area that was logged. Uh, and just to kind of quickly go through this, we, have a, we had an ignition happen in the evening. Uh, by the next day, that fire was 20 hectares, grew in total to about 61 hectares. We had fire crews on scene with about, in about seven minute, minutes from when it was reported. That included several fire departments. It included BC wildfire crews. We had neighboring island departments, including Salt Spring Fire actually assisted on this fire. Uh, we had Parks Canada crews come in and we had contract structure protection crews. So I know sometimes it feels like you're all alone out there, but if there is a wildfire, you're gonna have the cavalry coming from hundred different directions. Uh, in total, we had 100 wildfires or 100 firefighters in that area, uh, much better than 100 wildfires. Uh, that fire did cause an evacuation. That evacuation impacted 119 residents, uh, most of whom ended up being housed with friends, neighbors, or on island building, and all of whom returned to their home in within three days. We didn't see very much spread in the standing timber on this fire. So that's important to know. That was really a regen fire or a slash block, block logging fire. Uh, 
the farthest we really saw that fire spread into the standing timber, into uh, what we normally think as the forest, was about two tree lengths, so not very much. Uh, and the closest that fire got to home was about 150 meters. So much closer than we would prefer, much closer than we're comfortable with, uh, but certainly not uh, right licking up against the structures. So why do we talk about this fire? I think it's because from my perspective, uh, I think it's the type of fire we can expect to see more of in the future. So we can expect to see more moderate intensity fire behavior. We use a ranks system to describe wildfire intensity in BC. And so when we're talking about that moderate intensity, we're talking about rank two to rank four. And you see that infographic at the bottom. That's the, what the fire would look like. Uh, those fires would in evacuate individual blocks or neighborhoods. And you can expect that fire to last several hours or several days. What is far less likely, we never say never, um, but what we think is, is really unlikely for you to see in Salt Spring Island in the coming years is any sort of high intensity crown driven fire behavior, particularly a rank five or a six. Those are the types of fire behavior that we are seeing in Lytton, we are seeing in Fort McMurray and Slave Lake, Williams Lake, uh, but the potential for that is just very rare here in Salt Spring. Uh, we don't expect to see people uh, evacuating entire islands or entire communities, very unlikely. Uh, and we don't expect fires that last for several weeks or several months. That is what we're seeing in the interior, but we don't expect it here on the island. Uh, so what can we expect? Uh, we can expect smoke. So uh, in any given year, there's not a very good chance that you're gonna be impacted by flame. Uh, it can happen and you should be prepared, but there's a very good chance that, that this year and every year that you might be impacted by smoke. Uh, I'll play you a really quick video here from Minette NASA. And the reason we play this is people are often saying, hey, where is the smoke? You know, when it came in last year in September or in 2017, this infographic, for example, is from 2017. And people are looking across, is that fire coming from Vancouver? Is it coming from Lake Cowichan? Is it coming from somewhere else nearby? But generally, the answer is no. Generally, that, that fire uh, and that smoke is coming from California or far away in interior BC or Alaska. And you can see how that smoke moves all across the globe, uh, shifting, moving in and out. It's there one day, it's gone the next, or it'll settle in for days. Uh, really hard to predict. Uh, and why do we care about wildfire smoke? It's because we're learning more and more each year about the real serious health impacts that smoke have for people. It's particularly that really fine particulate. It gets into your lungs and it can even cross into your blood and really cause inflammation. So we see types of health problems that you would not normally expect to see. For, for example, during wildfire smoke areas, we see an increase in heart attacks, cardiac arrests. We see a, an increase in uh, strokes. We see increases in asthma, of course, and all sorts of respiratory. So lots of different diseases. And the greatest risk happens to small children, pregnant women, elderly folks with lung and heart conditions, anyone who has to work outside for, for sports. Uh, and our message to you is don't evacuate. Don't try and outrun that smoke. That can often be our first uh, reaction as we want to get out of there. It's the chances of you actually escaping that smoke is lower than the chances of you exposing yourself to more smoke by trying to escape it. So by packing up and getting in your car and getting off island and driving away, a uh, very good chance you're going to end up breathing more smoke than if you had just went inside, limited your outdoor activity, uh, closed windows and, and doors, and just kind of um, kept yourself safe and away from that outdoor smoke as much as possible. I do know that you know we're seeing more and more heat activities. So if you do feel the impacts of that heat uh, and you have those doors and windows closed and you're worried about the health impacts from that, it is better for you to open those windows and doors most likely than to and breathe the smoke than to uh, deal with the impacts of that high heat because uh, that's also a bit of a danger for us. So the last chapter of what we're going to talk about today is how can you prepare your family and your home? Because when you think about fire, we often think it's a force of nature. You see it just you know, run out the trees and run over towns. And what could you possibly do to keep yourself safe? 
Uh, and the answer is a lot, much more than you might think. Uh, the main thing you can do, honestly, is have a plan. You're going to be making these decisions one way or another when you evacuate. But the more thing, decisions and planning you can do beforehand, the better off you're going to be, the more prepared you're going to be, the less stressed you're going to be. And the best thing you can do is commit that plan to writing. Commit that plan to even a, a smartphone, a laptop. Uh, don't just sit there and think about it in your head. So going through the exercise of actually making a plan is going to help you. And I'm going to send out some information. And we're going to put it here in the chat about how you can make a plan. Once you have a plan, it's important that you have equipment to keep yourself safe during an emergency. So there's a few things that we want to make sure that you have out there. And that includes a first aid kit, prescriptions, any kind of medication that you might need during an emergency. It can include food for an extended length of time. We recommend at least one week on your area. Uh, it includes special kinds of clothing. Uh, it can be water. Water is a big deal. We recommend having a lot of that on hand. Uh, and then having that in a format that you can grab relatively quickly, having something that you can just pick up and get out of your house with, we call that a grab and go bag, really worth it. Not just for wildfires and even not just for emergencies, but life happens. And sometimes you just need to get out of your house and be somewhere in a sh short period of time. That grab and go bag, that emergency preparedness kit, is going to make your life a lot easier uh, in a case of emergency as well, in case of wildfire. And it's an important thing that, that you understand what's going on. So stay in the know. Uh, and here, what I'm really um, going to pitch at you really hard today, honestly, is our Capital Regional District Public Alert Notification System. We call it PANS. This is a system that uh, sends you information about exactly where you are or where you live on the island. And it sends that information to you immediately, instantly. Anything that we know in the Emergency Operations Center, and if we need, we have information about how to keep your, you and your family safe, this is how we're gonna send it to you. It's easy to sign up, it takes about three minutes. Uh, one thing it is not is about twice a year, your phone goes, uh, boo -doo 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 -doo. and that is an emergency test system. It's actually called Alert Ready you won't be receiving any information about an emergency like a wildfire on your phone that way. So don't expect to be receiving information that way. If you don't know if you're signed up for PANS, that means you're not signed up for PANS. You have to opt in, you have to subscribe. Please do it, there's no downside. Uh, go to that website, you know, you can sign up. It, please do it today. We're gonna put that link in the chat. We're gonna send you this link. Uh, and it's going to allow us to give you information that will keep you safe uh, when an emergency happens. We don't use it for any other purpose. No spam whatsoever, I promise. Uh, the other option that you have is Alertable. That is a tool that we have now on the back end. It's a pretty cool little system. Uh, you can see what the information is at the website, alertable.ca, and you can see information on emergencies that are happening across Canada that way. But even better, what the thing I really recommend is that you go onto your smartphone and download that app. So it happens, doesn't matter whether you're an iOS or an Android platform, you can download the Alertable app. And what happens is it's gonna give you information, uh, emergency information based on where you are, no matter where you are. So if you're in Victoria, if you're in Esquimalt, if you're in Vancouver, all of these emergency programs are using Alertable to send you emergency information when you need it. And you're going to get that information if you have the app, and you won't get that information if you don't have the app. So the last thing, and, and a really important thing to do, is to protect your home. Uh, and a lot of people think, well, what can I do? That fire is going to sweep across, and it's going to look like Lipton. We're going to lose our house. Uh, what can we do? And uh, you can do a heck of a lot. These are the, the wildfire structure survival statistics, just to give you a rough idea of the difference it makes. If you do nothing at all to your, um, to your structure and you have a flammable roof and you have bark mulch all around and trees touching your hosts, yeah, you're, you're, it's a good chance you're going to lose your house. Uh, there, it could be as low as a 4% chance of your house surviving. But if you do some basic things, we're not talking about weeks or, or hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of dollars in investments in your house. 
you can drastically increase the chance of your home surviving in, to in excess of 90%. Uh, and so what did we see there? Uh, just you know, broadly, we saw fire extreme fire conditions. We saw that fire start in wild fuels in the forest. It moves to an urban environment, to the homes. Instantly, the fire department's overwhelmed and then most homes there were destroyed. So what can we do about it? What do we uh, push in terms of uh, things that people can help us with uh, from a firefighting perspective? We want to break that chain. We want to break that connection between the wild forest fire and the homes that uh, we want to stop the transition from vegetation to built infrastructure. And how can we do that? Uh, and do you have a cheesy video to show me on this? Yes, I do. Uh, and so I'll, I'll play that for you now. As we continue to extend our lifestyles and communities into the forested and grassland areas of the country, we become more exposed to the danger of wildfire. Living where wildfires can occur puts our homes at risk, but it is possible to live safely and resiliently with wildfire. Fire Smart principles are designed to mitigate a home's vulnerability by taking proactive action on our properties to reduce wildfire risks. Homes ignite due to the condition of the home and everything that surrounds it out to 100 meters from the foundation. This is called the Home Ignition Zone. Let's check in with the residents of Aspen Street in the community of Little Blue to see the proactive steps they're taking within their Fire Smart Home Ignition Zone. Hi, I'm Levi. I've lived in this house for over 25 years. Wildfire seasons are starting earlier, lasting longer, and are more intense. We need to take action. Residents in the community next to us were evacuated last week and suffered devastating loss. We need to take ownership of our part in the overlapping home ignition zones in our neighborhood. Starting with the most critical zone, the non-combustible zone, which should be a minimum 1.5 meter non-combustible surface around your entire home. I've cleared the vegetation and combustible material around my house down to bare mineral soil, including combustible debris from under my deck. Hi, I'm Sandy. Priority Zone 1 is between 1.5 and 10 meters from your home. To create a landscape that will not easily allow fire to reach our homes, my husband and I moved our renovation materials out to Priority Zone 2, breaking them into small organized piles. Firewood piles have been moved to Priority Zone 2 and patio furniture into the shed. We also plan to incorporate some fire-resistant landscaping products into our yard. Howdy, my name is Colin. I've been working in Priority Zone 2, 10 to 30 meters from your home. The trees of the vast forested landscape that our homes back onto need to be pruned to 2 meters to prevent fire from climbing the trees. Keeping fire on the ground will make it much easier for firefighters to manage. Hi, I'm Alex. I've been busy in Priority Zone 3, which is 30 to 100 meters from my home. To create a fire break, we've hired a professional arborist to come in and thin out the thick spruce trees we have in Zone 3. I'm also going to prune the remaining spruce trees up to 2 meters and clear the dead and down woody debris. In subdivisions like Aspen Street, priority zones can overlap. It is important to talk to your neighbors and identify ways that you can work together. We've all taken one small action on our properties, but we need to do more, and we need to do it together. I say we contact our local fire department and see what else we can do. Agreed. Agreed. So there you go, uh, a really brief introduction to FireSmart. Uh, for more information, talk to your local fire department. Salt Spring Island Fire Rescue has a really great program for FireSmart. They have some, some materials, I believe, even on their website, and we're gonna hear more from them immediately following my presentation. Uh, as well, firesmartbc.ca. So that's firesmartbc.ca, really good resource for that. Uh, if you don't know where to start, start at your home and around your home. That non-combustible zone is incredibly important, and that zone one is the second most important. Uh, we do hear oftentimes concerns, uh, for good reason, about sending people in and around their homes with chainsaws, and this idea that, hey, you 
moved to Salt Spring Island because it's a beautiful place, a natural place. You don't want to go and ruin that. And uh, we certainly would not want that either. Uh, there is sometimes a misconception though that really dense understories is a natural part of the ecosystem in Salt Spring. And generally that's not the case. Uh, what we consider natural on that top line there oftentimes is the result of decades of active fire exclusion. So it's the result of people going in and changing the landscape by removing natural fire. And uh, oftentimes what we're doing with FireSmart is actually trying to restore that ecological integrity, kind of trying to mimic the role of fire as a natural disturbance process on the landscape. So that's with the thinning and the brushing, fairly light on the land. We're certainly not asking you to go through and log. That's not what FireSmart is. Please don't do that and tell you that uh, uh, Jonathan Reimer uh, was, was uh, behind it. And really what we're asking you to do in terms of FireSmart is to give us a chance. Uh, so you may be disheartened to hear that even wildfires have paperwork, uh, at least for us here on the fire, in the wildfire service. Uh, I'm not with them anymore, but I've certainly filled this out a, certain, a number of times. This is uh, something that we fill out usually once we evacuate people, but before the fire comes. We're gonna be uh, heading around your community, looking at homes and looking at what can we do to make these homes as resilient to fire as possible. And we have to rate that home as defensible, defensible, or not defensible. Uh, and if you we get to a home and that fire has uh, you know the cedar shake roof that's beautiful and it's close, we have trees touching the home, we have a big open deck with lots of bark mulch underneath, uh, and and uh, there hasn't been anything done to prepare that home, uh, we're going to have to move on to the next home because it's too late. There's nothing we can do as firefighters to increase the chances of that home surviving. Uh, it's, it's, it's really just nothing we can do. And so we're gonna move on to the next home and use our time there where we can make a difference, where we can put on sprinklers, or maybe all we need to do is move a pile, up, pile of, of uh, firewood or something like that. So one last push, uh, we are hiring here in the Capital Regional District uh, a fire smart ambassador to try and get this message into communities if that sounds like something that you're interested in or you know somebody that would be interested in that, let us know very quickly. It's on the website. This position closes tomorrow. So uh, you, please go and register if you'd like to. Uh, and I'm asking you to do three things today. We talked a lot about wildfire. We talked a lot about uh, what it means for your community, but it doesn't mean anything at all just sitting around and talking unless something happens, unless you are able to do something with the information we've given you. And there's three things I'm gonna ask you for, to do today, please. The, the first one, really easy, go sign up for CRD's public alert notification system. It takes three minutes. There's no reason not to do it. Number two is to go back on that app store and download something called FireSmart Begins at Home. And what that's gonna do is step you through a self-assessment of your own home. And what that allows you to do after the assessment is just give you what is, some simple things, some easy things that are going to make a big difference to how fire smart your home is. It doesn't mean that you have to rip off your siding or redo your roof or, or invest a lot of money. There are, I guarantee you, some simple things that you can do in the next week to make your fires, uh, your home more resilient to fires. And the last thing I'm gonna ask you to do is sit down with your family and make an emergency plan and have a kit that would support that plan. And we'll have some resources in the chat about how to do that. Really simple to do. Write that down. Uh, do it on paper. It's worth it. And that's all the information I have for you today. My name is Jonathan Reimer. I'm the manager of Electoral Area Fire and Emergency Programs. That's my uh, email address. If you have any questions at all about how to keep yourself safe uh, from emergencies and wildfires specifically, don't hesitate to contact me. And you're going to find a lot of answers at that lower website. That's our Salt Spring Island Emergency Management website. Uh, a ton of information there on uh, what to do before, during, and after an emergency. So I hope that was useful. And I'm just going to stop sharing here and introduce our next speaker. Good to see you, Mitchell. Um, Mitchell is the local fire smart coordinator for Salt Spring Island. Uh, he is your fire prevention officer uh, with Salt Spring Island Fire Rescue. 
and uh, he has some information that I'm actually really excited to hear. Without further ado. Yeah, so hi, I'm going to share my screen now, now that we've done that. Uh, that one. Hopefully you can all see that now. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, landscaping on, on Salt Spring as a way of helping to mitigate the effects of fire. And I, this is an image of one of our crews fighting what is a fairly common event on Salt Spring, uh, a small scale wildfire. We get about uh, 17 per year on average, kind of five to 40, five on a low year, maybe 40 on a big year. The largest one we've ever had on record it was uh, 10 hectares on uh, Mount Maxwell in 1982. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with that unit of measurement, a hectare is about the size of a soccer field. So imagine 10 soccer fields on fire. Typically, the fires we catch are actually much smaller than a hectare, about the size of the one in this image and, uh, and or smaller. So, oops, ooh, I moved very quick. So, okay, so we've got these fires. They happen commonly. What I'm showing you on this image is actually not a Salt Spring fire, but this is Williams Lake in 2017. And I went on deployment to Williams Lake to help with the wildfire up there. And I saw something that fire scientists have been studying for many years, decades. And it's this, this interesting phenomena that uh, a wildfire can sweep through an area and some houses survive and others don't. And well, you might notice some trees survive and others don't. And some, once upon a time, we used to call these miracle houses or miracle trees. But it's not a miracle at all. It's actually fire science. Fire, like water, wants the path of least resistance. It travels over the easy fuels. So if there's something that's easy and ready to burn, it'll burn that. And when it encounters an area that's non-combustible, like, for example, a gravel driveway, then it doesn't burn and it doesn't move like a, a tidal wave or a wall of lava. It sort of spots around like we saw in that um, video from Fort McMurray. If it hadn't been for the spot fires, the highway would have stopped that fire. But embers and brands jump ahead in the wind and land and find maybe a little nest of exactly the right kind of fuel and then they burn that. So if this is an example of a couple of houses that actually survived. What would seem like an unsurvivable event. A massive wildfire moved through this area, destroying dozens and dozens of homes. But here's an example of a couple of homes that we went to and it's like, wow, they survived. And before us, this scientist, Dr. Jack Cohen, looked at that and thought, well, what is it that helps homes survive? And he, meant, he discovered that something that Jonathan already mentioned, that homes that have had some work done around them and hopefully don't have a cedar shake roof, he found, Dr. Cohen found, that about 90% of these homes that had clearing for about 10 meters or 30 feet and um, the right kind of building materials, they survived. And, um, and actually, following the Fort McMurray fire, um, Dr. Alan Westhaver went to that area and he reconfirmed that research. About 81% of the homes that had a good fire smart score survived. So, so what's this fire smart thing? Well, what fire smart actually boils down to is some simple uh, home and garden maintenance items and uh, a little bit of planning when you're gonna do some landscaping. And, and maybe if you're gonna do a renovation, you might wanna factor in some fire safety things along with other things that you might be considering like cost and aesthetics. Fire smart is not an all or nothing. It's a harm reduction model and little things can make a big difference. So you start by taking a look at your yard and you divide it into zones. And the reason why you do that is the most important zones are the things closest to your home. And Jonathan mentioned that non-combustible zone in the first 1.5 meter or, or five feet if you use the old measurements. That area is the most critical area to help defend your home. Imagine if, if you're trying to protect your home from snow, for example, the snowflakes are going to collect around your home. The embers collect like snowflakes. And imagine where, you know, a dusting of snow would collect 
by your home? Is it gonna land on an area that would be volatile? These little embers, they're, they're quite small. If they landed on you, you, it'd be an annoyance, but they wouldn't even really burn you. you you'd brush them off. And the same with your house, they'll, they'll land and eventually they'll fizzle out. But if they find some dry grasses or some dead cedar, they can ignite that and then maybe light the shrub next to that. And then maybe your wood pile. And then before you know it, your siding's up and it's getting into your roof. That 1.5 meter zone is critical. And, and that's an area what we, that we really wanna focus on. Now, it doesn't mean your, your property has to be a moonscape. There are some things that you can do that uh, are, are, are gonna be better than others. And those would include things like removing volatile uh, conifers. And maybe you might leave some fire resistant plants like, like watered flowers. Flowers aren't gonna to wanna to burn. You try to light a tulip on fire, it's, it's not gonna burn. As you move farther away from your home, you can take a little bit less zeal on how much attention you give it. In that next zone, um, the up to 10 meters or 30 feet, I'll be pruning and thinning and maybe uh, move my wood pile beyond that zone and my propane tank if that's feasible. Um, as I move farther and farther up to say 100 meters, you know, I might not be quite so concerned about the branches on the ground uh, 70 meters from my home, but I'd be paying attention of are there some dead trees out there that might need to come down. There are many different types of landscapes that can work within this. It's not an all or nothing or one way is the right way. Uh, this, these are images from uh, Salt Spring Realty magazines. Uh, vegetable gardens, they're just big buckets of water, essentially. Nothing in a vegetable garden is going to want to burn. Um, many flowers are fire resistant and, and actually would help to uh, add more protection for your home. So um, we're gonna explore a few more things that you could do that fit within this fire smart model. And I'm gonna touch on a, a couple of themes of like, you know, simple. One is short green grass is safer than long dead grass. Um, many people here don't water their lawns in the summer. I certainly don't, but I mow it short and I mowed mine last, oh, now a few weeks ago and it's not going to grow again. But if I'd left it as a tall dead meadow right up to my door, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, grass fires move very quickly and they're quite dangerous. The grass itself is not going to light the house on fire, but it might light that juniper bush next to my house. So keep your grass mowed short. Um, another one is the idea of, in general, deciduous vegetation is much safer than uh, coniferous. And, and that comes back to the way these, these plants behave in fire. Deciduous tends to have a much higher moisture content than um, conifers. And the chemical composition of these plants was slightly different too. Conifers tend to have more, more volatile oils. Some of them will even burn when they're green. So, um, and then on top of that, they'll drop material, dry material that is more likely to burn than the leaves that fall from deciduous. Another simple basic concept is reduce the density of vegetation near your home. This first image shows, you know, you can see one uh, shrub burning has ignited the next, has ignited the next. They are close enough in proximity and already a volatile conifer, they're gonna keep going. And if they're close to your home, like this image from, this is from some of our colleagues in The Chosen who have very similar vegetation to us, that can threaten your home. This was a really a close call and a lucky break that that stand of juniper that burned on this person's um, hillside there, we caught it, or, or, or our colleagues in The Chosen caught it before it got under their deck. And uh, you can imagine the deck is a much more vulnerable part of the home than, uh, than if it was just straight siding there. So reducing density makes a big difference. Um, hopefully we don't have any conifers near our home, but, um, but if we do, let's, let's have them farther away and fewer of them. Now this image is Alberta, so it doesn't look anything like us, but it shows kind of a good before and after. And it's funny, just this weekend, I was doing some fire smarting around my own yard and I thought, ah, I should have got the before photo and I could have done the before and the after of our landscape. The concept is prune up to two meters in height. That's only as high as you can, you can reach, that's six feet. 
Um, that's about stopping if there's a fire on the forest floor so it doesn't get up into the canopy. And then thinning the trees so they're not touching each other will stop um, a, a canopy fire from spreading from tree to tree to tree. So pruning and thinning. And, it, this is not an all or nothing thing. You don't have to do this prescriptively through your entire property. It's in the area most immediately around your home. And it doesn't necessarily have to include all species. So for example, if you've got some maples in there mixed in with the conifers, those maples are gonna kind of wilt and wither as long as it's a healthy tree. They're less likely to catch fire and they'll, they'll actually help to protect you. An orchard of fruit trees, for example, will be even safer because the, uh, the pectin in the, in the fruit trees even acts as a, a greater fire resistant. So we want to help prevent that forest floor fire from going up into your canopy. Then there's some features you could add, and maybe you already have. Maybe you have either gravel or lawn paths, or maybe you have some rock features, or maybe you even have water features. These concepts of hardscaping, they create fire breaks, kind of like what Jonathan was showing me earlier about firefighters digging down to mineral soil. Well, you can create little fire breaks on your property that of course you have there for other reasons like enjoying your gardens and walking around on paths. But those things, those features are helping to defend your home. Then, now, now many places on Salt Spring struggle with having water and, and, and many of you are probably concerned about drought. So you, maybe you've already planted some drought resistive species. Well, xeriscaping or planting drought res um, resistant species is another way of fire, fire smarting your home. In general, most fire uh, or drought resistant species are also fire smart. There's a couple of exceptions, like, like broom will grow very well in, in a drought and so will eucalyptus. So you, you want to be a little bit selective about what you do, not just, just in general. So you, you want to know what's in your garden. And I'm going to hold it, if you're looking at the little tiny image of me, there's a, a guide called the Fire Smart Landscaping Guide that you can find on that, that link that Jonathan and Alex have shared, the Fire Smart BC link, which is also on our website, the Salt Spring Fire um, website. And you can look up plants and find out, are they on the helpful list or are they on the very brief naughty list? And if they're not on either list, that means they're somewhere in between. But learning about what you have in your garden is um, you know, a big step towards helping to protect your home. And if you don't know, I, I should let you know, we're perfectly happy to come and visit your home and do an assessment with you. And we can give you some tips about the plants. Now, another one that I get lots of questions about and I wanna help you um, in a way that Jonathan is also be rest assured that most of the, the vegetation around your home is fire resistant. These plants have adapted to a fire ecology and many of them have fire resistive qualities. I constantly get asked about salal on the top right corner. Salal is a fire resistant species, as are Gary, Gary Oaks, which you can see in the image below, as are all of the fern species. Arbutus are also a, a fire resistant species. And I noticed there was even a question in the comments there. Um, they do drop a lot of dead materials. So if I had, oh, and I do have an Arbutus right next to my home. So I try and keep on that material. And, and some of you might be thinking, oh God, that's the one problem about Arbutus trees. They do drop leaves and bark. So you do have to sort of stay on that. Um, but like big leaf maples, as I've already mentioned, they're fire resistive, ocean spray, uh, Oregon grape or Mahonia, these are all fire resistive species. So in general, the native plants around you are helping to protect your home. But we do have to be mindful of the conifers, which does include Douglas firs. And I have to draw particular attention to cedars, which are starting to struggle. And many of you may have seen uh, cedars dead or dying or looking stressed on your property. And if you are, I, I, I'm afraid you're gonna to have to address them. I would bring in a professional arborist to look at those trees and either prune them back or, or um, bring them down uh, because they do offer an additional threat. Douglas firs, once they mature, are fairly fire resistive. That thick cork-like bark helps to protect them from fire. And the way that they naturally drop their lower branches helps to prevent them from uh, getting a canopy fire. 
However, you'll notice that the young trees uh, don't drop their branches yet, and they don't have that thick bark yet. And those are the trees that would burn if you had a wildfire, which I guess gets back to that idea of looking at the zones around your home. Look at that and, and try to imagine if there was a fire and the fire was going to consume the dead material, the branches on the ground, um, you know, old trees that haven't rotted yet, but have fallen down, maybe they're suspended a bit, those things would burn. And the juvenile uh, fir trees and cedar trees, especially the sick and dying, those are the things that would burn. So in my opinion, I would go around and, and cut down most of the juveniles, unless they're in a spot where it's like, oh, I wanna let that Douglas fir grow up. The larger, more mature Douglas firs around them will have way more room to grow, they'll thrive much better instead of competing with these little trees. So we, we do some selective pruning and thinning. And this is not creating a moonscape. This is not removing all the vegetation. Mostly I focus on removing the dead vegetation. But then also people have had a tendency to plant things like spruce and juniper. And those uh, foreign species, not from here, are much more um, fire loving. So they'd be good to get rid of. In addition, there's some grasses that are problematic. Now, I'm not a big grass specialist, but pampas grass and, um, uh, oh, uh, oh sorry, I forgot the other one, um, fountain grass. Those two burn quite readily, as do broom and gorse, as uh, Jonathan mentioned. And one image there shows a giant uh, broom fire in uh, Ireland, where apparently they're, they're suffering with broom fires along with us, as does New Zealand. A uh, broom and gorse will even burn when they're green. So those are things that you're going to want to be mindful of on your property. I, I try to remove them. And you might have a stand of, of pampas grass or, or fountain grass that you think is quite lovely. Well, if it's 30 meters away from your house or even 10 meters, and the area around it is maybe a short green lawn, well, you could just look at that and go, that, that's OK. I'm going to absorb that risk. In my particular example, I've got a big, beautiful cedar tree that's almost touching my home. Well, I'm not going to cut that down. I prune the bottom of that tree up to two meters, and it's mostly on a sheep pasture that is green and nibbled short by the sheep. So it's unlikely to catch fire. And if that tree becomes sick, well, then I'll have to readdress that. So it's not an all or nothing. A couple more things I want to touch on, a bark and chip mulch. These things support fire quite well. Um, embers or cigarette butts can land in them and start a smoldering fire that on their own won't really become a problem. But then if that's touching something like the pampas grass or a juniper, it could ignite those things. So we don't recommend uh, bark or chip mulch close to your house. Now, I actually have bark mulch in my vegetable garden for the paths, but my vegetable garden is far from my house. That's an appropriate place. So in your gardens that are, you know, more than that non-combustible zone, and, and even better still out of that zone one up to 10 meters is going to be much safer. And then we have to look at open burning. Um, open burning is the leading cause of fire, hands down, on Salt Spring Island. Um, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, almost all the fires on Salt Spring are, um, are caused by human caused, and then far and away, the number one cause of fires. Uh, within the human caused is open burning. I've only been to one lightning caused fire on Salt Spring. I talked to the chief about it today. Chief Holmes is also in his 25 year career. He's been to one lightning started fire. So we, between the two of us, we could only think of two. Um, so coming back to open burning. If you are going to do open burning, please get a permit. The whole concept of the permit is to teach you a safe way to have a fire. And there's some regulations there about having it far away from your home, making sure you've got water on site, and certainly you're not burning right now at this time of year when all burning is prohibited. Um, another thing is consider alternatives. Maybe you might want to burn or compost or hugel culture or biochar. Um, if you are going to do things like burning, please consult with somebody who knows what they're talking about. Um, my, my neighbor, Brandon, apparently is the, uh, the burning specialist on the island, and I actually hope to have a meeting with him one day. What I do know about burning is piling a big stack of sticks in the woods is not burning. I, I tried it myself. Uh, five years later, they were still there, kiln dried, ready to, to be fired. So don't do that. If you want to burn, they have to be in contact 
with a soil. And that would mean either putting compost or soil on top or grinding the branches into the ground. If they're not in contact with the soil, they're not going to compost, they're not going to turn into soil. They'll, they'll just be there, fossilized, ready, ready to burn. Well, not fossilized, they'll, they'll be ready to burn. So um, find out some alternatives. Also, the particulate smoke, not good to inhale. Um, from, from the open burning or the wildfires. So you're not doing your neighbor's favors either. Um, so if you do burn, contact us. If you can find an alternative, that's even better. A little bit more. I did mention that we'll come to your door and do an assessment if you're so interested. Uh, we've got a special program right now where um, either myself or some of my colleagues will come. We'll do a walk around with your house and help you do a fire smart assessment. It takes about half an hour. Um, sometimes if your property is a little bit larger or more complex, or you've got lots of questions, or you start showing us really cool things in your garden, which I found has been happening a lot over the last two weeks. I've seen some really beautiful gardens. They could go a little longer, maybe 45 or an hour. Um, but that's really only based on people who want to sit and chat and we'll have a glass of lemonade or what have you. If you then do that, we come and do an assessment. Many people on the island are eligible for rebates, and that is everybody who is uh, a senior, 65 plus, or if you have a disability and you can't do the work yourself, we offer this little carrot, a uh, $250 rebate if you have to bring in somebody to do some work, either an arborist or a landscaper or a chipper. Um, we will also recognize if you want to get, you know, pitch in with your neighbors. Maybe um, I, I was just talking to one person today who th there's four properties that have a shared one between them, and it's kind of this tragedy of the commons. Well, those four pro properties could uh, chip in together, hire a chipper, and uh, clear the property and uh, have that material chipped if they wanted. And the rebate would cover that. They could add their four together. Um, the, uh, the one other thing you have to do is, of course, save your receipts. And then you invite us to come back for a second uh, visit and we can see, oh yeah, you did one of those things. You don't have to do everything we recommend, but you did something to make it better. We can see that and check out that little box. I make a copy of your receipt and then we write up a check. So that's a cool thing. And, and that's thank to a, thanks to an economic recovery grant that we got through the province. So if you want any more information about that, please give us a call at the fire hall uh, or you can contact me and here's my contact information. Send me an email, give me a call at the fire hall. As I said, we're happy to come and do one of these assessments. If you want to know more about that, there's information on our website. And we'll also do other things too. Uh, just last night, I got invited to the Reynolds uh, Neighborhood Emergency Pod group. They had a lovely little garden event. Uh, they shared some emergency information within their pod, and I gave a presentation about FireSmart, much like the one I just did with you here. Um, I can come and speak to your pod if you'd like, or maybe you have another group. I've spoken to church groups, gardening groups, Whatever, if you, you want me to come, I talk to the university uh, women of Salt Spring Island once. Um, you want me to come and speak to your group? I'll come and speak to your group. You can tell, I like to talk. Uh, another thing we can do is there's a neighborhood recognition pro program through FireSmart Canada, and we can help you jump through the bureaucratic hoops to get that. Uh, Maracaibo got recognized last year. Uh, huge kudos to them. They, uh, they've done a, a great uh, deal of work on their community spaces to help uh, protect their community from wildfire. And uh, they got an attaboy from uh, FireSmart Canada and a little money to throw a party and get some tools. So if you'd like to do something like that, and it doesn't have to be as big as Maracaibo, uh, the new neighborhood recognition program could be you and a couple of your neighbors, like just your street, maybe half a dozen homes or, or, or less. So um, if you want to know more about that, give me a call. Anyway, I'm going to uh, turn the floor over back to Jonathan so we can do uh, questions. Hey, thanks a lot, Mitchell. Uh, that was excellent. I learned a lot. Uh, you weren't kidding when you called yourself a fire nerd. Uh, <laughs> and I think we you have a couple of fire nerds in front of you. We've burned for a whole hour and a half, but, but we're here for the questions. So if you have to leave, we understand. We're staying. We're going to answer the questions that you guys have given us. Uh, and we're going to start off by reading a few selected ones. So one question that we have here, is the evacuation order a must? If under an evacuation order, are you legally bound to comply or could you stay in your, on your land and fight the fire? I think I know the answer, but staying and protecting the home makes a lot of sense to me, especially if you know the risks and accept them. 
I have thoughts on this question, but uh, as the kind of the fire department of note here, Mitchell, uh, do you want to speak to that one? Oh, I apologize. I was actually reading the next question to get, get ready. I thought you okay. had this one. <laughs> I can take this one because I've, I've been into commander on a lot of these fires for the BC wildfire and Paris Canada. Uh, the short answer is yes, it is a must. Uh, evacuation orders are legally binding. Uh, we generally won't come and throw you in jail for them. Uh, it gets complicated with minors, but I'm not even going to go there. Uh, the idea is that if you are in that area, we can't save you. Uh, so if that fire comes and surrounds you, we're not communicating with you. We're not coming to uh, to help you in your home. But uh, usually when you leave, like eventually you're going to run out of food and water. If you leave that area, you can't get back. It becomes incredibly complicated. And so it, you're making yourself a lot less safe and you're making everybody in the area less safe because sometimes us as, as responders, we we want like to say that we're not going to come help you, but sometimes we try. Uh, and that puts us at a, at a great amount of risk. The idea of staying and fighting the fire, I, I really sympathize with that. You know, it's, of course, walking away from your house when there's a fire bearing down on it, it it's a really hard thing to do. Uh, but in the end, it's priorities. Is it, what is, in the end, it's a house. It's, it's not the same as your life. We do have people that die uh, trying to save their, their homes. We had two people that died trying to save their home in Lytton just a week and a half ago, a huge tragedy. So that is the worst of all possible outcomes. We'd much rather lose many thousands of homes than a single life to a fire. Uh, and so trying to, accepting the, the risk for me, that's not, um, that's not an excuse, honestly. Uh, if there's an evacuation order, that means the, the relevant experts have looked at this. It's not safe to be there anymore. We don't take that decision lightly. Please do leave. Uh, please get out of the way. We're probably not going to throw you in jail. It doesn't make it a good idea. Uh, any, do you agree with that, Mitchell? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've witnessed that up uh, in Williams Lake and then to Kaiser Creek in, in uh, 2018 as well. There were, there were some people that stayed behind. Uh, yeah, hugely dangerous. And I, one of them, the RCMP actually forcibly removed somebody because they were a, a threat to themselves and others. So uh, yeah, please if, if we're asking you to go, we're not just making it up. It's, it's a serious event. Yeah, I agree. Next question. Are the masks we've all been using for COVID protection of any use against fire smoke? Uh, would you like to take that one, Mitchell? Sure. So, uh, well, N95 masks are designed to protect you from um, particles that are 0.3 of a micron in size. And when we're talking about wildfire smoke, we're talking about something in the, more in the magnitude of a couple of microns or maybe just under a micron. So yes, an N95 would protect you. However, um, you know, you might notice it's, it's, it's cumbersome. Um, if a, a N95 gets moist uh, from your, say, working or breathing, they should be replaced. So for example, if we wear them, we, we, we are supposed to replace them every hour or so if we're wearing them. Um, so you'd go through quite a few if, if you're wearing them for days. The, the main recommendation is, is try and stay indoors and uh, uh, avoid exposure. Uh, you know, maybe not go for that jog uh, in the wildfire smoke conditions. Um, save your outdoor work for a few days. Uh, you know, so reduce your exposure, but an N95 will help. Excellent. Good answer. Uh, next question. Uh, this one from somebody who I think has caught that uh, we should be promoting your website, Mitchell. Uh, the question is, don't, doesn't the Salt Spring Island Fire District website or Facebook page have fire info as well? And that is completely correct. So I, I didn't give that enough shift. And maybe, Mitchell, can you do a little bit of sales pitch for your website? Yeah, no, so a couple of things. And I, I, when, I, when that question popped up, I noticed it was we were talking about emergencies at the time. So we've got great prevention information on there. And if you, if you see more that you want, let, let me know. I, I, I'm happy to, to add more. But um, I think people were also wanting more information during emergencies. And I really heard that message following the 2018 windstorm that this was a big criticism from the public. They wanted more. Now, the tricky thing is, when we're right in the thick of it, uh, we're often strapped for manpower and we're trying to solve the big problems. And often uh, communication to the public will go down a couple of notches uh, in priority until we've got a tackle on like the big life safety issues. And we will try to address those. And I've recognized 
me personally, I will bump them up in priority of like, okay, as soon as I can, as soon as I got a grapple on this big problem, okay, let's now try and notify the public. And I can see that there's some opportunities to add more people to our organization as volunteers or, uh, there are people in that capacity who could maybe help us out with monitoring social media and providing more updates. And if you think, hey, you know what, I could be that person, get in touch with me, get in touch with our organization. We realize it's like, okay, there's people who want to help. Maybe that's a way you could help. Agree. And I echo everything you said there, Mitchell. As far as uh, we're seeing an increased desire for people to know what's going on immediately. Uh, it used to be that we could just get to work and, and, and the, the information would filter out there. But it is true that timely information actually helps people make good decisions for their own safety. And we're realizing that from an emergency operations center perspective. So we're trying to do a better job of, of keeping you guys informed during emergency. I'm gonna make one last plug for that public alert notification system. If you need to know something about your public safety in your area, we're gonna be sending it out there. Uh, please do register now. So another question. Uh, there's a few questions on evacuations, and I'll start one with one here. Uh, is there a documented procedure for evacuating the island? For example, would it be walk-on only for the ferries? So I do want to reiterate a point I made a little bit earlier, uh, and, uh, is that the likelihood of evacuating the entire island of Salt Spring for a wildfire specifically is uh, just, it's, it's basically not going to happen. Uh, you know, you hate as any type of emergency manager to say never, because you're going to live wrong, long enough to see yourself wrong. But in this case, a wildfire on Salt Spring Island, the amount of uh, good fuel breaks that you have on your landscape there would basically make that an impossible situation. So we're, uh, well, we're, it's not that we're not making plans to evacuate the islands and certainly walk on ferries is a good way to move a large amount of people off the island if necessary. Our plan A is to, uh, have our evacuees um, taken care of on the island. And we have a number of uh, partners and locations that we have prepared to be able to receive folks, to put them up, whether that's on island billeting or uh, cots or um, kind of food stuffs and so on that we have to serve them. That's plan A is to keep it folks close to their house because very likely that fire is gonna be a short lived event, could be a couple days and it's gonna be easier for folks to come back to their homes that way. We do, of course, talk to our, our partners. If we need to, we can have people shelter either in uh, large centers like Duncan over the Crofton side, or obviously the other area we, we look at is um, the Sydney Ferry from Fulford, and then moving people into the core, into Victoria and so on. So those are things that we have prepared for, but unlikely that you're gonna be seeing them. Uh, the next question for Mitchell. Can you talk about the chipping program? There's lots of questions regarding dead vegetation. So another uh, opportunity for you to plug the good work that you guys have done there. Yeah, so there's a couple things. Um, so we've been working with the Conservancy for, for a few years now on the Broom and Bloom campaign and supporting them with, with those efforts. Um, it, it's also run a lot on donations and volunteer work. So we really appreciate those uh, contributions from members of the community. Um, so that's been one of our big focuses. And then in 2020, last year, um, we did do a, a chipping program as a trial. Um, it was a great idea, but it was a little bit tricky for us to administer. And um, it's also a tricky one to get funding for. So we, we might try that again, but it's, um, it would be funding dependent because it's, it's costly to bring in a, a chipper and go to people's homes one-on-one uh, -on -one like that. Having a regional drop center where people can bring it is way more efficient for the chipping. Um, so that's one we'll, we'll look at, but we'll definitely partner with the Conservancy for the, the Broom and Bloom chipping campaign again. Another thing is, remember that uh, Fire Smart Home Assessment that I was talking about, you could use that rebate towards bringing a chipper to your home and doing some chipping work. And if you have your stuff to be chipped, um, all set up and ready to go, you could probably do it for within that $250 rebate. Good news. Thanks, uh, Mitchell. And we have a, a couple questions talking about the responsibility of livestock owners or pet owners and how does that work during a wildfire? Obviously, people are very reluctant 
to leave uh, any of their livestock or their pets during an emergency. We totally understand that. That would be heart-wrenching. We don't recommend it. Uh, and just like uh, how a local government can't necessarily come and protect your home for a fire smart, and we can't make your personal preparedness plan, we can't go and, and, and into your neighborhood and, and tell you as a pod how to behave, we do really rely on personal preparedness. So we rely on folks who have ranches, who have farms, who have pets, to do uh, exactly what we talked about in terms of making a plan, having a kit, having a grab and go bag. And there's a lot of resources online. Uh, if we're getting a lot of interest on that, uh, we may want to put out uh, a little bit of information. The Ministry of Agriculture has good information. BC Wildfire has good information. Um, Emergency Management BC has great information on how to make an emergency response plan for your, for your ranch, for your pet. Uh, you know, what you don't want to do, and this is the same if you have medical condition, if you have anything that you know you need, uh, you'll have that ready for you because uh, we're doing our best as the local government, but we'll, what we can't do is know your exact personal situation and prepare for that. Uh, we're really relying on you to, to uh, know the hazards and, and take a bit of personal responsibility for having that plan, having that kit. Uh, anything to add on that, Mitchell? Well, yeah, it's funny. I, it's it, like, as fire departments, we have uh, mutual aid agreements with our neighboring departments. And it's funny, I, I have a little farm myself and I have kind of like some mutual aid agreements with my, with my neighbors. Um, so it, you might not have to evacuate your, your livestock or your pets off the island. You might want to look at, can you make some relationships on the island? It might be as simple as moving your, your animals from your place across the street or through a fence to your neighbor's place. That might be enough to provide them the protection they need. Remember what, what Jonathan was saying earlier, I do not anticipate the kind of event on Salt Spring that would involve a mass evacuation. However, I am planning for an event similar to what happened on Galliano. I anticipate in, in my career, my what the years that I have left, that there will be likely a big fire. And But I'm picturing more in the neighborhood of maybe a dozen homes might need to evacuate. Think about more in that scale. Can you work out an arrangement with with some of your friends on a different part of the island or even across the street, that, that might help. That's a really good point, Mitchell. Uh, and the idea that the community is helping themselves, that's always something we saw in Galliano. I know Salt Spring has that same type of community spirit where people are always asking, what can they do to pitch in? Uh, and what can they do to help? And in the, the, these types of emergencies, we really see communities pull together and I expect no less of Salt Spring. I know that you guys have that volunteerism on the community and uh, very likely everybody you know from across the island and your neighbors and your friends, they're, they're gonna be asking, how do we donate? How do we give food? How can we put people up? Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's the type of spirit that, uh, that really gets communities through these sorts of uh, evacuations. Uh, the next question, and I believe we're gonna take, I think two more and then we'll end this one, uh, is a question about sprinklers. If a fire is close to our home, if we put a sprinkler on our roof, will there be enough water pressure for it to work? Or even more so, will there be enough available water for it? And I know, Mitchell, you were on structure protection crews during an evacuations in uh, Williams Lake. Uh, what did you see for in terms of this? Yeah, th those are really good questions. Um, first of all, yeah, you'd have to test it out. Um, Water pressure on Salt Spring in many places is not great. So you might not um, have enough pressure for a sprinkler on top of your roof to, to reach as far as you'd like it to reach. So I would, I would test it out. Um, that's one. And then your second question, is there enough water? Well, when we set up sprinklers in Williams Lake, we drained the Williams Lake Reservoir in an hour. Um, mind you, we had sprinklered the entire city. Um, so uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. I go around recommending, Hey, you can defend your place with sprinklers. And then I think to myself, if I tell that to everybody and they all have their sprinklers going, we will wipe out, uh, St. Mary Lake and, and, and Maxwell Lake in, you know, a, a shocking amount of time. But, um, if you have your own cistern where you stored some water, uh, that would be, you know, uh, responsible, um, setting up a couple of sprinklers, it might not take as many as you think, like, some homes might get by with one sprinkler or maybe two or four. If they're set up high, they can be quite effective. And again, we probably wouldn't have to have everybody sprinklered. And, and in addition to all of this, 
we have a sprinkler protection unit, which I, I should probably mention. We have a trailer that has, oh my God, I can't even think how many sprinklers. I, I've got enough to do probably 20 homes or more. There's probably, uh, oh, close to 100 sprinklers in there uh, for different kind of configurations and different setups. So we can set up sprinklers as well. So you, you don't have to buy all this equipment because you already have with your tax dollars. Actually, we spent the money that we got from Williams Lake on that. So it was uh, the province. Well, good plug. And, and just to know, it's not just that one trailer you're going to have in terms of a, a large fire. We're going to have, be bringing folks in from all parts of the province. The same way we did that uh, you went to Williams Lake, Mitchell, of course. We're going to have crews from the island and, and all parts of the province coming in here on a larger event and setting up as, as many uh, structural protection units as we need. Uh, one thing things I always try and caution folks on the sprinklers is oftentimes people will set them up and they'll turn them on and they'll walk away, they'll be evacuated. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. You obviously wanna, uh, sprinklers are really effective actually, uh, but you don't know how long that, that fire is gonna take to get there. Sometimes it can be a week or more uh, that you're gonna be evacuated and that fire still hasn't arrived. If you have that fire, if, if for some reason you don't drain Mary's Lake, maybe it's only a few people, and that sprinkler is going for several days before crews are getting in there and turning it off, you can do serious water damage to your home. So, uh, you know, in some ways you've avoided the frying pan and jumped into the flames. So with the sprinklers, be a bit wary. I generally say, hey, if you're around and you're worried, set them up, turn them on, that's great. When you have to evacuate, generally turn them off. The structure protection crews will go in there, they see that infrastructure, and we're gonna know, we're gonna turn it on, we'll see if it works, we'll see if you get that water pressure. If it doesn't, we're gonna find a water source. Often we find pools or cisterns or lakes or rivers, and we're gonna use the, the tools that you already have set up. Uh, we use our own garden hoses as well, even to protect homes on that. And so uh, certainly no downside to setting up sprinklers. You don't necessarily need to do that, but if you wanna go that extra mile, it's definitely not a bad idea. Uh, and one last question before we leave. The question is, if you get a home assessed for fire, is that information shared with insurance companies? And Mitchell, you're the guy doing those assessments. Uh, what, are you, what are you telling us? Well, currently, no. It's not getting shared with anybody. In fact, well, I have to, I have to save it because I get audited by the people that gave us the grant, the province. But that we're not sharing the, the information with anybody else. I anticipate that down the road, Insurance companies are either going to go with the carrot or the stick on FireSmart. I think they're going to either demand it, kind of the same way we do when we have a, um, a wood heat questionnaire. In order, in order to get your insurance, you're going to need to prove that you've tried something. Or maybe they'll go the other way and they'll give you a discount. But I don't think the insurance companies can sustain the kinds of losses that they've been getting. And the stuff that's happening in California and Australia is affecting your insurance rates. You might have noticed, I just renewed mine. And yeah, that's why they're going up is they're taking these huge losses. So if you don't get into FireSmart now, it's okay. The insurance companies are gonna probably encourage you down the road in a couple of years. Excellent. Uh, that's the, the, the short answer is if you want an assessment, don't worry about, there's not a privacy. It's not, we're, we're not going around and making these public. We're not sharing them with insurance. Please do reach out. There's no downside to getting a FireSmart assessment. Mitchell's going to show up and tell you all about his lovely garden uh, and uh, you guys are going to have a great time. It's definitely worth it. We really encourage it. Uh, if you don't want to have that visit, tons of resources online, both at the, the Salt Spring Island Fire Rescue website and at firesmartbc.ca. So with that, uh, I know we didn't get to everybody's question today, um, but we did talk about fire for almost two hours here. So uh, we kind of want to give you guys your lives back. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this was a really useful uh, webinar from my perspective. I hope you understand more about what your risk is and what you can do to protect your home and your family. We hope you have a safe wildfire season. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.